Hi and welcome. It's great to have you here. Uh, today, in today's discussion, we're going to talk a little bit about what's known as the unconditioned. What is it? How do we interpret it? How do we understand that? I'm Doug Smith of the Online Dharma Institute. That's onlinedharma.org. If you're new to this channel and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a calmer life, consider subscribing to this channel and, and click the bell down below if you want to receive notifications when I come out with new videos. The unconditioned. What is it? How do we interpret it? How do we understand it? This is a, a word, a concept that we'll run into from time to time when we read about Buddhism or hear about the, the Dharma in some uh, respects. It is, of course, uh, well, I shouldn't say of course, but it is a word for nirvana, for the goal of our practice, for the aim that we're sort of uh, aiming at. Uh, but it's a sort of a weird way to describe nirvana as the unconditioned. And sometimes it's even written with a capital U. Um, where do we find this idea? Well, let's look to one early text where it's discussed. Here the Buddha says, There is, monks, an unborn, unbecome, unmade, unconditioned. If, monks, there were not that unborn, unbecome, unmade, unconditioned, you could not know an escape here from the born, become, made, and conditioned. But because there is an unborn, unbecome, unmade, unconditioned, therefore you do know an escape from the born become made and conditioned. So the question is, what is this unbecom unborn, unbecome, unmade, and unconditioned? It's again, sounds very abstract and very sort of esoteric. It sounds like something sort of eternal and unchanging, something permanent. We might even conceive of it in almost platonic terms. Uh, Platonic terms meaning related to Plato in the, in the West. Uh, Plato was a philosopher in the West who talked about these unchanging forms that lay behind all things and that the, uh, the aim of philosophy was to uncover these unchanging forms that lay behind all of appearance. The danger, I think, with here and with Buddhism is to go that route, to take this too seriously, to, to think that the Buddha is talking about something really platonic here. Not to say that there's no way to interpret it that way, there certainly is, but is that really what the Buddha was getting after? That is to say, nirvana, what we're talking about here, shouldn't really be thought of as a thing. The Buddha doesn't discuss it as really as a thing, but rather as a getting away from things, if you like. It's not something to cling to, as we might cling to something called the unconditioned, but it's rather an attempt to get away from clinging. That's the whole idea. In an online thread over at Suda Central, uh, Bhikkhu Sujato, who, discusses, who discussed this issue, I think, quite well, uh, says that the Buddha uses these kinds of eternalist phrasings, like unconditioned and unmade, unborn, he uses them in order to undermine them in some respect. Sujato says that the Buddha here is using uh, phrases with an almost Upanishadic feel. Now, what does that mean? Well, this Upanishadic feel, that, that refers to the Upanishads. The Upanishads were a group of texts uh, written by Vedic Brahmins uh, in the centuries after the construction of the Vedas. The earliest Upanishads were written perhaps a hundred years or so before the Buddha's lifetime. It's hard to say for sure. But in any event, it looks as though the Buddha is responding to some of these Upanishads. And the idea behind the Upanishads, at least some of them, is that we have this eternal soul, uh, this Atman, and that the goal of the religious life is to unify that soul or begin to understand that it is unified with Brahman, which is the eternal principle, the universal principle behind all things. And when we understand that we are the same with this Brahman, then we essentially become free. We, we have reached the goal of the religious life according to the Upanishads, or at least according to some of them. There's a, a different ideas in different ones, but in any event, that's one main one. 
And so the idea here that, uh, that Sujata is pointing to is that by using a term like unconditioned, it's sounding as though this is a kind of an eternal principle behind all things, and that our goal as Buddhist practitioners might be to, in a, in a similar way, uh, find that we are identical with this unconditioned, that we uh, sort of merge with it and unify with it. Well, that's well and good, but then how is this reading undermined? In other words, Buk uh, Bhikkhu Sujato says that he undermines these kinds of eternalist readings, but how? And Bhikkhu Sujato doesn't say in, that, in this particular thread that I'm talking about, I'll leave a link to the thread down below, by the way, um, uh, but there is a, a sutta, another sutta, in which the Buddha says that he's going to teach us the unconditioned and the path to the unconditioned. And that sounds very promising, okay? So now we're going to learn what is this unconditioned that, that sounds so strange and esoteric and weird. So we go to this text. What is the unconditioned? The Buddha says, and what is the unconditioned? The ending of greed, hate, and delusion. This is called the unconditioned. That is to say, to be unconditioned means to be not conditioned by these unskillful states of greed, hate, and delusion, or ignorance. Now, I would, I would call this a, what we might term a, a deflationary approach to the question. In other words, it's taking a, a very inflated concept like the unconditioned, which I, again, I say sometimes people write with a capital U, and we, it sounds like a huge balloon that we're blowing up here, but the Buddha's response again is to undermine this, to deflate it. It's not something enormous and big. It is difficult to attain, there's no question about that. It can be uh, a question, uh, almost impossible to attain, it's very difficult. But it's not something that's very esoteric and difficult to understand. It's something really quite simple. It's just getting out from under greed, hate, and ignorance. So it's also under, we should also understand that it's not some eternal thing that we're trying to find a way of unifying ourselves with, but rather it's a bunch of different states or tendencies that we're trying to get rid of. So we're trying to get rid of these uh, unskillful states of mind, these unskillful tendencies that, ten that arise within our mind, and by doing so, we are becoming unconditioned. So in this case, as with in many other cases with the Buddha, we have to be very careful with his phrasing, with the words he uses and how we interpret them. Because oftentimes, he will use uh, words that other people use in a particular way in order to shock us in order to make us make our ears perk up. And then he will do that once we've gotten our attention to sort of deflate these ideas in the same way that he'll talk about uh, the great man being the Brahman. Now the Brahman, Brahmanism is a separate kind of view, but he used the word Brahman to describe people who act well, but he used the term in a way that the Brahmins themselves would not have used it. In the same way here. Now, I've, all, I've just described what the unconditioned is. Now, what is the path of the unconditioned? Because the Buddha says he's going to teach us the, the unconditioned and the path. And once again, we wonder, okay, the, the path of the unconditioned, is it some very difficult to understand esoteric kind of practice? And what the Buddha says is the path of the unconditioned is mindfulness of the body. Mindfulness of the body. Well, so... It, it's another deflationary approach. Again, it's not some enormous big thing that's difficult to understand. It's something simple. It's a difficult practice, no doubt. It's one that can take our entire lives or maybe even longer. But it's not something difficult to understand. Indeed, it's, it's a practice of getting to know change, a practice of getting to know illness, getting to know death firsthand. It's this kind of practice of, of learning about aging and change and the way that all things pass away. It's just that kind of practice. And indeed, if you want to consider that, consider the practice that will get you to the unconditioned, 
I have a video on mindfulness of the body, and I'll leave a link to it up here on the screen. I would suggest checking it out next. If you're getting something out of these videos, consider uh, checking out my Patreon page. It's linked down below and helping support the channel. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you on the next video. And meanwhile, all of you, be well.